Excuse me, my task is to welcome all of you. My name is Carol Minkiti, and my husband, it was Ifani Binkiti, who passed away two years ago. And my children and I, my four children, and I promised to keep this sacred place going. And we love it, and we hope you love it too. I'm so happy to have Roger, Roger Reeves here tonight, a very, very special poet. So enjoy yourselves. Thanks for coming. Hello, my name is Fiona. It's my pleasure to introduce Sandra Lim. She was born in Seoul, South Korea. She's the author of two previous poetry collections, Loveliest Grotesque and The Wilderness, chosen by Louise Gluck for the Bernard Women Poetry Prize. She's received many honors for her work, including the Levis Writing Prize, an award in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and fellowships from McDowell and the Getty Foundation. She is a Guggenheim Fellow in Poetry and lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I'll let more people come in. I'm very excited um, to be introducing Roger tonight. Um, we read many, many years ago um, together and it was so much fun and it's been just a great pleasure to read through this new book a beautiful cover to best barbarian um, so i'm going to do a little introduction roger will read and then um, we'll be in conversation but i welcome questions from the audience so roger reeves is an associate professor of english and creative writing at the university of texas at austin His poems have appeared in the American Poetry Review, The New Yorker, Plowshares, Poetry, Boston Review, and The New York Times, among other publications. He was awarded a 2015 Whiting Award, two Pushcart Prizes, a Hodder Fellowship from Princeton University, a 2013 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, and a 2008 Ruth Lilly Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. His first book, King Me, won the Levis Reading Prize from Virginia Commonwealth University, the John C. Zacharis First Book Award from Plowshares, and a Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Book Award. Rogers' poetry draws from rich and varied sources. The poems invoke writers and musicians from Dante to Mahalia Jackson to Drake, from James Baldwin to Virgil, and they broadly investigate the intricacies of language and history. He often uses different personas to explore the violence and politics of poverty, gender, race, and self. And while many of the poems in the highly intertextual Best Barbarian address interlocking violences of white supremacy, police brutality, and colonialism in the US, as well as cultural and personal grief, they speak and sing in a broad range of tones and forms sometimes moving between agony and rapture in a single page. I hope to ask you about love poems tonight. So please welcome Roger Reeves. Children listen. It turns out, however, I was deeply mistaken about the end of the world. The body in flames will not be the body in flames, but just a house fire ignored. The black sails of that solitary burning boat 
rubbing along the leg of lovers flung into a Roman sky by a carousel. The lovers too sick in their love to notice a man drenched in fire on a porch or a child aflame mistaken for a dog, mistaken for a child running to tell of a bomb that did not knock before it entered in Gaza with its glad tidings of abundant joy. In Kazmira's, a god is weeping in a window. One golden hand raised above his head as if he slipped on the slick rag of the future. Our human kindnesses, unremarkable as the flies rubbing their legs together while standing on a slice of cantaloupe. Children, you were never meant to be human. You must be the grass. You must grow wildly over the graves. I want to thank uh, Sandra for introducing me and being in conversation with me. I want to thank Rolliers and James and just this, this space. Um, and it's one of, this is the first place I walked into when I, when I came to Cambridge, I was like, oh, I got to go to this bookstore. I've heard about it for years and I just came in and it, it's been complete love ever since. You can feel the warmth of it, all the books. Please come, don't let this be the only time you're in a poetry bookstore. <laughs> I know many of y'all love poetry, so this is y'all come. Um, I'm just going to read, you know, a few poems from the new book. I'm still getting used to them being in the air. Uh, and what I'd like to also do is dedicate this reading to, I think of him as a sort of a poetry uh, forebear in some ways. Um, and uh, a lot of the poems are in conversation with him and unfortunately couldn't be here uh, tonight. And that's David Ferry. Grendel, all lions must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord. His voice is weary as water broken over his scalp and a storefront sanctified church's baptismal pool. All those years ago, when he wanted to be somebody's child and on fire in that being. Lord, I want to be somebody's child and chosen water spilling over their scalp, water taking the shape of their longing, a deer diving into evening traffic and the furrow drawn in the air over the hood of the car, power, and wanting to be something alive and open. Lord, I want to be alive and open, a glimpse of power the shuffle of a mother's hand over a sleeping child's forehead as if clearing the city's rust from its face, which we mostly are, a halo of rust, a glimpse of power. James Baldwin leaning into the word light, his voice jostling that single grain as if he might drop it or already has. I'm calling to that grain of light, to the gap between his teeth where the many of us fatherless sleep and bear and be whatever darkness or leaping thing we can be. In James Baldwin's mouth, my difficult beauty, my weak and worn, my future is any number of angels, which is not unlike the beast Brendel, coming out of the wild heaven into the hills and halls of the meat house at the harpist's call, with absolute prophecy in his breast and the desire for mercy for a friend, an end to drifting and loneliness. And in that coming down out of the hills, out of the trees for once, bringing humans the best vision of themselves, which of course must be slaughtered. Cocaine and gold. I never wanted to be this far into the business of heaven, chasing my father, hunting his soul in the corn and confusion of this harvest. My father who is hidden in the last sheaf of heaven, maybe heaven itself, 
my father, the corn wolf, who we must kill but is already dead. We will learn nothing here of sacrifice or the cocaine of beauty. My hands chattering in eulogy, which is a search for order, which is nothing but the elimination of beauty by artifice. By artifice, we cauterize my father's drifting life, a minor cosmetic surgery. Like liposuction, a funeral is an elimination of nature by artifice. By artifice, do you repeat yourself? Very well then, I repeat myself as a heaven, as a golden harvest, as a broken ocean of corn. The search for beauty is the elimination of death, which requires dying, which is the business of farming, which no one cares to do anymore in America. And like dying, we'd rather rent it out. Freedom without freedom. To hold your dying father up to a razor beneath a golden light and cut him finally in and out of the world. Into the West. It would seem clear that no one could call upon thee without knowing thee. Though Augustine writes of God here, notorious for his absence, he could also be speaking of desire, pleasure, the tick of snow against the dry leaves, which sends my daughter spinning on her heel, the sound of it, that daddy, that. Sometimes the world, it's luring, joy is just a that, an absence that calls, demonstrates its over thereness, its being, but without a proper name. So a silence sounded as when I enter the clearing I once begged for, you at an instant, absolute and looking back at me as if witnessing a calendar or road you've already passed through. So my face now and whatever wolf, vulture or golden horn of pleasure, a that, a ticking of snow against the wet road, nameless, thee, where you've been and left the body of that being. So I, so I hurry and press into your leaving like a leaf scuttling after the dream of itself into the sharp wet of the snow against the skin on into the west where desire and sometimes pleasure is a type of faith. What you call me to in this spilling, this motion of night, your hair loose in the water of your back, your spine has become the eye you wish for me to see through but I must close my two good eyes, which is the beginning of any apocalypse or rapture, our daughter or the day, us touching the north and south of each other without compass or rose, this stumbling, a type of faith too, a seeing but without the dependence on sight or some heavenly ruin, a signal of an end. It was like the deer outside, gathering at the window, licking the cold glass to smoke. Okay, come on in, come on in. Hey, Tracy, carry on. That's family, they're coming. That's family, come on in. If y'all need an extra seat, there's one right there, y'all. Mm -hmm. This next poem, so this, this book deals a lot, obviously, with grief. Uh, the, um, my father passed almost a year to the day my daughter was born, so within her first birthday. And I, I didn't grow up with my father, and I, and I got to know him in my 20s. You know, you have that build that adult relationship. And I thought, oh. He's gonna be. He's gonna have the opportunity to be a granddad. Um, and then on my first Father's Day, uh, I get a call, and they're like, "Your dad has eight weeks to live." Uh, and it was a really rare form of cancer. And within ten weeks, he, he did pass. So a lot of the poems for the and I say this just because the title of it. A lot of the that first year after he died, right? So I'm dealing with. So I'm thinking about like my daughter's changing, right? She's becoming, and then that year after, all I could do was just write like every poem somehow would veer back towards my father. 
even poems that didn't even seem like they were starting there would just be like, eh, and here we're gonna look at my father again. Uh, and think about sort of what it is. And, and so uh, I'm gonna read a few sort of in that spirit. Uh, this one's called After Death. To get the light and dead coming through the window without distinguishing one from the other is the day with and without its mastery. Stumbling upon a dead deer in a neighbor's field, knowing it was left there for you, not as muse, but as memory dropped, broken off, death no longer concerned with this beast that once covered a field with the white breath of its longing, because the animal is beyond death and death has no interest in what is beyond. So now it's off the stair at this barely standing there drunk, swaying beneath two sides, hanging on two boards above his raised eye, the afternoon drifting into doorways, death now in a pocket of pines in the thick hair of a boy who turns a skunk over with a stick, watching the Christmas of its intestines steam in the snow. Death touching the boy where it is, he will know him beneath the arm, as if raising him up to this common understanding. Desire is everywhere in this field, even in me who is not in this field, but from my many windows, watching the night's dark light fall and dwell in its falling, which sends me stumbling to my newborn's invisible breathing, wanting to ensure the invisible holds, my fig branch finger stretched beneath her nose, me wondering what is beyond death? And what is this rage in darkness? And my father, what is he other than dead? Rage and so much life and so much life. I'll just read uh, about three more, I think. And uh, yeah. I've been thinking about this poem a lot uh, after the funeral. A white cat has come to sit on the backside of slaughter, to sit on a white bull bearing a necklace of pomegranates. The cat has not come as any witness to a crucifixion or a coronation, not as angel or symbol of some comfort creature, some benign break in the dying, but as human wish, as distraction from suffering, my human wish to keep my father's schizophrenia in his casket, to keep that below the earth, one from another, now and forever, in season and out, from mountain to mountain, in the trees and after, amen. Everything has come back to prayer, sitting in that delay, harrowing the fixities, my father in me, in my clock, my hoof, my feather, and the sprawling armature and stars of I am. Lord, am I worthy? Have I devotion? What body built? A flood of cancer, of winter, of woman. Lord, I pray as I've been taught to keep nothing from my tongue. It's palm, it's golden mine. So it bees and bees, whatever it bees. Rose, rain, Lord, even her, even her who rises from this bed, the naked two-ness of her filling the room such that she becomes the room. Lord, am I ready? How shall I bear the coming madness if it, if it is to come? What disaster will I deliver to my daughter? My human wish, distraction, a white cat balanced on the backside of a bull, slaughter far off. This delay, Lord, this delay I offer, because I own neither houses nor land, have not a hundred heads of cattle or of state grazing on grain in a golden green field. Keep this coming distant, this sickness underground. And if, Lord, I am, if I am to bear madness, become the father who scratches the raw earth with his hoof and snout, plowing the field as ox or ass, because the mind says, go, go, into the pasture, not as ox or as ass, but go ox, go ass, then Lord, let me into the field, but make Lord, diviner of the snowflake and master of fragments, a light, a golden light to the tree. And there, 
Half my daughter stare at its work, the darkness in the green, and the leaves and red blooms, while I, behind her, lick the tines of a fence and leap in the dust in front of a white cat that has become my master, that I follow out to a white bull bearing a necklace of pomegranates. Um, I'm trying to think. I always like to read one I've never read out in public. I read that out in public. Oh, so the last two poems um, during you know pandemic had to was doing a lot of being in the house as most of us were being in the house. And uh, one of the things I do with my daughter is we read a poem. We generally read a poem. I try to get her to read every day. And when she was younger, she was definitely more into it. Now she gets older. She's like, oh, I don't want to read the poems. Uh, I was like, well, we got to read poems. I was like, you ain't going to church, but we're going to read some poems. <laughs> and so uh, during the pandemic, she was, we were reading poems and she started like really getting it. And she would sometimes, she would say, daddy, I'm going to write a poem. And, you know, she was four. So she, you know, her writing was reciting. Right. And she just would have, you know, just, you know, it's, I don't know if it's my daughter, so I'm like, oh, that's amazing. But there were just times where I was like, the poet in me was like, that's really good. <laughs> that's really good. You're because you know, kids, they're just like, they're just they're trying to make a great sound, right? They're just like, I want to get caught up in the rapture of sound, which is what I want to be caught up in too. And so this next poem actually ends with a line from one of her poems that she said. And she said, anytime I read this poem, I have to tell the audience that it's her. That is her line of <laughs> so. Naima, so one day in posterity, she might find one of these readings on like, you know, the 40 year version of YouTube and she'd be like, my daddy did keep up his promise. So this poem is called Journey of Ascension, the Nanda, which is also um, the, the, the name of an album by Alice Coltrane. Um, and she's, Alice Coltrane figures very heavily in this book. She's one of my favorite uh, artists. I, I find her to be a kind of mentor in certain ways. Um, and so, yeah, you'll, you'll, Everything else will just be gold. Journey to Sanchen de Nanda. Alice Coltrane, her harp fills in the cracks of me with gold. The Japanese call it kintsugi, where the vessel broken only gold will permit its healing, its history, its how the stars understand us. Lemon flowers on the skin of the earth. Mosquito filled with the blood that sirens its fat long life. Who isn't dying to leave this house, to go masked only in the shadow of one's animal breathing, lonesome, unprotected, knowing nothing lives as foreignness or death, that the black dog with the sword in his mouth passing from house to house will not bring its itch, its ticks and locks clogging our lungs, a permanent quarantine, nothing that a little gold melted to ichor and spilled into the veins won't seem. Everything is a blue divergence on a harp. The red bells and the purple crepe myrtle this morning forgetting that soon they will be the corpses the spring tree kneels to observe. No, no, they remember as everything dying remembers its mother's name. Say your mother's name, not for power, but for the glimpse of power to be more than a hesitation, gold filling in the cracks, a window thrown open for no other reason than to continue a blue feeling. Nothing needed other than this devotion to darkness, a fire gotten brighter. My daughter holding my small name in her mouth, light broken, beloved, my daughter, a window thrown open, her voice gold filling in the cracked basketball court of me announcing all nature all nature will be dead for life soon she really did say that all nature will be dead for life soon how did you know that how did you know? and so this last one uh because we have children here and i love when we have children uh i remember being i remember my first poem was when i was in second and third grade and we were, it was the first, like, I had grown up in the church, so I really didn't realize I had been, like, the Bible was, like, this really long extended poem. So I had that, you know, growing up in Pentecostal church, which means I had a lot of poetry even before I knew I was having poetry. 
lesson. But then second and third grade was my experience with secular poetry. And I remember we were having what's called an elocution contest. I don't know if y'all remember this, but it was memorize a poem and you had to deliver it well. And it, like you get ranked and you could win, you know. So I was like, oh man. And the year my first elocution contest was we had to pick between two authors, two poets, either Shel Silverstein or Jack Perlutsky. And I'll never forget, everybody was running after Shel Silverstein. I went to Jack Perlutsky. And I remember I did Gus's Greasy Spoon, right? And so like in a lot of ways, you know, like, becoming the poet, becoming an artist starts this. And so I always like, I always want to give children something, right? Like I, even, so um, it's great to have family here, you know? Um, and so this poem is, is for, for children. I wrote it during uh, the uprisings in Austin uh, during George Floyd. Uh, and there was all these, everybody was focused on like Ford Motor Company's statement about diversity and this, this company. I was like, what about what about who this is really about, right? We out here because we want the children to have something a little bit better. We ourselves want something better, right? It's not about Ford, you know what I mean? I don't know if Ford is sponsoring this, but, <laughs> but like, you know, like I, it's, it's not about corporate America and sort of how we're moving the neoliberal idea of race forward, right? This stuff is happening with real people, real bodies. My daughter, I didn't read the poem tonight, but there's a moment where, so I'm trying to teach her about all this during the uprisings and things like that. And there's a reason I'm calling them uprisings, right? There weren't protests, these were uprisings, right? This is revolution, right? It just sometimes revolution takes a long time, right? This is the ongoing civil rights movement, right? The civil rights movement doesn't stop in 68, right? We still doing it, right? And so I was trying to teach my daughter about this long history, right? This, and I was teaching about the police. And I'll never forget one day we're standing by the mailbox, getting the mailbox, and she hears a police siren. And she says, daddy, are they coming to kill us? And I was like, I couldn't say no. I said, I hope not, mm -hmm. right? So this poem is for, for the children in us and for our children. For black children at the end of the world and the beginning. You are in the black car burning beneath the highway and rising above it. Not as smoke, but what causes it to rise. Hey, black child, you are the fire at the end of your elders weeping, fire against the blur of horse, hoof, stick, stone, several plagues, including time. Chrysalis hanging on the bow of this night in the burning world, burn, baby, burn. Anvil in iron be thy name. Yea, though ye may walk among the harnessed heat in huntsmen who beat their masters, who, be, who bear their masters hunger for paradise and your rabbit death and the beheading of your ghost. You are the healing snake in the heather, bursting forth from your humps of sleep. In the morning, your tongue moves along the earth, naming hawk sky, rabbit run, your tongue poisoned to the filthy democracy, to the gold dome capitals where the guard in their grub worm colored uniforms cling to the blades of grass, worm on the leaf. Worm in the dust, worm, worm made of rust. Sing it with me, dragon of insurmountable beauty. Black child, laugh at the men with their hoofs and borrowed muscle, their long and short guns, the worm of their faces, their casket assembling of the afternoon. Leftover leaves from last year's autumn scraping across their boots. Laugh, laugh at their, at their, their assassins on the roof. For the time of the assassin is also the time of hysterical laughter. Black child, you are the walking on of water without the need of an approving master. You are in a beautiful language. You are what lies beyond this kingdom and the next and the next and fire, fire black child. You want to sit or stand? Oh. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, I, I can stand. I can. But if you would prefer to sit, that's fine. Well, we yeah, we sit behind here, I guess, right? Yeah, I guess we'll grab the we'll grab the chairs. We'll... Oh, oh. 
All right. Oh, I just feel like we're like selling lemonade or something so cozy back here. <laughs> um, thank you, Roger. That's such a beautiful reading. Oh, thank you. And um, oh, I I can feel that probably a lot of people have questions, but I'll just I'll just fire off the first sure. question. Um, we were we were doing a panel a little while ago, and we shared the same editor and publisher, and she said i didn't know this that the book had changed a lot from what she had first seen mm -hmm. and i'm always curious just like you know both as a practitioner like the kind of turns or swerves mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. makes when mm -hmm. when putting a book together so my question is really how, how did this sort of project or book begin for you you know some people write very much poem by poem others have like mm -hmm. sort of a master mm -hmm. structure in mind um I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, sure. So what I originally got the book contract for is not this. It was a completely <laughs> different. It was a long poem called On Paradise uh, that I've been working on since I've been here. Um, but I didn't, I wrote it in like a rush. And when I mean not a rush, it came out in like a year. And it was like 50 some odd pages. And I thought, it was funny. I was, so that was when I was at Princeton on this hotter and I was just like writing and I had all the space. And then I had my daughter. And it wasn't the, the bur it was watching her just be herself. And I thought of it as, a, as an aesthetic act in some ways. And I felt like she was, she was doing what I wanted to do in poems, just in her everyday life, moving in the world and becoming herself. And it, and it really shifted my sense of what I wanted in the work. And, and so I really didn't know how to edit that because the project was so ambitious in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So the project, I'll describe it. Um, what it is, is the project that I was called on paradise. And what it is, is it's, um, it's a dream, but it's also the dream of a, of a, of a man who's been lynched. And as he's been, as he's dying, animals take his body parts to different parts of the world. And he begins to experience the world from these various body parts. So his eyes get taken by birds to Gaza, uh, his, um, arms get picked up by like Romulus and Remus, right. And he's sort of, he's learning how to be dead. Right. And he's encountering sort of the world. And so it's like him sort of learning how to be in the afterlife and which was a very ambitious project. It was a project that started out with like kind of like, you know, when you're younger, and you feel like people aren't really seeing that you can do a thing, particularly in poetry. You'd be like, I'm going to show these motherfuckers. Right. <laughs> uh, and so I was like, but it was a project that I felt like had a little bit too much hubris in it for me. And, and it's not terrible. Like, I think we start that way. Like, I think we're often motivated by haters. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm a. I mean, that's sports in a lot of ways. Um, but I, my daughter just was so much herself. And I was thinking about something that the poet Terrence Hayes has said to me once where he said, I don't know if Nina Simone is a great singer, but she sounds so much like herself, it doesn't matter, right? And Thelonious Monk also says, the genius, he says the man, I'll say the woman or the person, the genius is the person that is most, just the most himself. And so I wanted to write a poem that was just like, myself and so one of the things that came to me and you get all that is I really I have like a lot of influences or a lot of things that I like to be in conversation with right so I'm hearing things I'm always like circulating and so I kind of have like uh and I'm also like very much steeped in a sort of hip-hop slash jazz aesthetic so I'm really interested in citationality I mean in like bringing different pieces and kind of creating that patchwork uh and so it wasn't until children listen mm -hmm. that I wrote I wrote children listen and I was like oh now I think I know what I'm writing towards, uh -huh. and that wasn't until 2018 or so. Um, and then again, my father had passed. So there was all this sort of, I just, I never thought I'd have a second book, to be honest with you. I just like writing poems. Yes. You know, well, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm with that because sometimes <laughs> for me, if I have a project in mind, it's, it's to the front of my brain is controlling it. So That's right. poem by poem. But I love that story because even as you're basically you're talking about the project that you started with a kind of defensiveness fell away mm -hmm. um and and there's love mm -hmm. just being herself mm -hmm. um i love that i do want to ask one more question before i open it up to the audience so i love the citationality because i mean your first poem was called grendel <laughs> thank you the berserker in all of us yes the berserker <laughs> the berserker um but i love how free you are with you know, all the different kinds of references, because I mean, sometimes my students are like, wow, Professor Lynn, all your references are to other books. And I'm like, 
that's who I like to hang out with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, yeah, or that's, yeah. It's a big part of my world. That's Some of those right. people are that's more right. real to that's me. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, but I was curious. I mean, you have so much background. I mean, in, in your first book too, with different personas mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, I, I basically, I love the first poem, Grendel, very much. Did you know that it was going to be sort of, I mean, it's the first poem in the book kind of announcing a lot of things. That was Jill. So that was our editor. Oh. Jill made the suggestion. That was like the third poem. She was like, why don't you move that to the front? Because originally it was going to start with um, Without the Pelt of a Lion, which starts Rage, Sing Goddess of the On Top of yeah. Love, right? So it's I would start out almost like the epic, right? Um, and so... Uh, and it's it's all about like getting Beyonce. Like I've always wanted, like, what if Beyonce actually sung the myth of the country? Oh my god! Like, wouldn't that be a great <laughs> album? Like, she's always looking for a concept album. I'm like, sing the fall of America, right? Like, sing the like fall of the empire, right? Like, you would be. I mean, that would you would be immortal at that moment, right? So That'd I so I was like, so I wrote the poem, right? I, like, if it were a project, this would be like. I would write Beyonce into like singing uh, <laughs> the fall of America, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, so Grendel did not start out that way. Okay. What wound up, it was originally a poem about Cheswav Miwosh. Ah. It was originally, not even about, like there was this moment. So I went to Miwosh's house and like, and he, Miwosh is a Polish poet, lived in Krakow. Uh, poet, uh, eventually became a Nobel winner. And I had the opportunity to go to Krakow Poetry Symposium, uh, which was hosted by the late Adam Zagieski, who was an amazing poet. Mm. If you don't know his work, is amazing poet, Adam Zagieski and Ed Hirsch. And I went over there and we were there about two, three weeks and we had access to Miwosh's house. And it was pretty, his apartment, it was pretty much the way he left it. His robe was still on the door, his shaving bowl. And I was just like, wow. And I was looking at his books and like there's English translations, there's, mm. there's Polish poets, you know, and, and originally I was sort of thinking about that, but then, and I wrote this poem and it wasn't right. And then I heard James Baldwin sing. Mm -hmm. And there was something in hearing James Baldwin sing that was so unlike his novel, so his novel, so unlike his nonfiction, so unlike what we think. And I heard tiredness and exhaustion. I heard someone who was weird and I thought, oh my goodness, it, it felt so, and I, I remember listening to it over and over again and crying. Like when I was lit hearing James, I was like, oh my God, oh. And so I was, so that's when all lines must lean into something other than a roar. James Baldwin, for instance, singing Precious Lord, his voice is weary as water broken. And I started, and it, and then all of a sudden it was like a collision of the we, me Welsh moment and the Baldwin moment. And then I was like, re, I was rewriting it at the beginning of the pandemic. So 2020. And I like, I, I have to say, sometimes I like when poems don't come to me immediately. Like you have to sit with them and they only come out one line every hour, which I think is like, I think we always think that it has to be like this unconscious rush. And I think like, <laughs> and I think sometimes it's just like, and it was just coming really slowly. And I was like, oh, this is, this is the temperament of this poem. Mm. And so I had to really listen to the temperament. And when I listened to the temperament, it was, it swung me to thinking about, oh, Grendel was probably black. Grendel is James Ball. Grendel is, if we really think about what if we know anything about Beowulf so Beowulf is you know it's all about the hero who comes and slays this dragon right but that or the excuse me this 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 monster that's on the edge of society mm -hmm. right is of color they don't understand his strength all of the like hallmarks of race are there with Grendel and I thought oh this is the first black man in literature in western lit right and I was like oh well, that'd be really fun to play with like moving him because I really one of the things I, I I love like old literature and I love reading old literature and reading against it reading against the way it sort of reifies westernness because I think the other is always right if we think about Toni Morrison's playing in the dark the other is always right there in the dark of the page right um and so there's no way that like and we know that Africans were moving into Scandinavia and so I just imagine that probably Grendel was a real person who was probably black, his mother was probably black, they were probably African, of African descended, and they lived up there, and folks were like, who are these black folks? They must be crazy. Um, and that's that's the, you know, it's kind of like Star Wars is the myth of America, right? Like there's a way in which Grendel is like the myth of Scandinavia. I love that. Yeah, no, I mean, oh, your voice is very epic, and the the just the different kinds of myths that are coursing all through the book. But I also just want to say, um, I appreciate um, even just you, you insisting that we should we should say uprising versus po a protest, 
um, a lot of the books, even though there are so many painful things and violent things, um, they feel very much, I mean, this is why I kept thinking of like love poems mm. and it's not just like, oh, let's look at the horror this, or aestheticize mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. There's something really kind of wild about love poems in general. So I was wondering if you had any favorite love poets or sort of influences other mm -hmm. than... Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You're the first person to ever asked me that. And there, there's like, I think Frank Bedard. Oh, okay. I think for instance, okay. he has that, he has a poem called like Love Incarnate, which is a, um, a retranslation of a Dante Vita Nova. Um, and so I really love Frank Bedard is a queer poet, uh, amazing, amazing poet. And he writes, he also writes very long, big poems. Yeah. Um, and I'm really interested in what he does with like sort of ecstasy and rapture. Uh, I love teaching the um, Sappho poem, the one that's the most frag, the, you know, like that poem to me is like the lyric part excellence. Um, I think I'm trying to, you know, Carl Phillips, another really beautiful. And also like, um, you know who has one of the best love poems, I think, is Gwendolyn Brooks. It's one of her late ones. Uh, she has this really beautiful, I wish I had it here. Um, it's, it's in her book, Blacks, and it's towards the end of the book. And she just has this beautiful, beautiful love poem. And I worked with this composer uh, in Miami um, at New World Symphony. And we were working on this little opera. And he was like, do you know, I put, when he was, he was older than me, he was like, when I was in, in uh, college, I put this Gwendolyn Brooks poem, this love, and I was like, oh my God, I love this poem. And so like, I think that poem and that has always just stuck with me. So I'm always interested in like love, um, you know, in, in ecstasy, thinking about like, I was in conversation with the poet Ricky Laurentis for a while about that, mm -hmm. right? And really thinking about what is the place of the ecstatic mm -hmm. in the middle of something like the ongoing catastrophe of anti-Blackness, right? Like, I think we can't delay love, right? We can't be like, okay, once we're free, then we'll be like, we're good. We have to like do it right now. We have to like like experience our ecstasy, experience our pleasure in the middle of a thing because there's no telling when that quote unquote future will be. And so I think we have to live our futures now, right? We have to say, I love you. I have to enjoy my pleasure. I have to enjoy my body now, right? Um, in the middle of it. And I think like our, I, I can't help but think that that's how, you know, my ancestors came up with like blues, you know, and like, and, and, their com and their comedy and how like, you know, and, and Jack, right? It was all about, okay, there's all of this surveillance and plantation deracination happening, but I'm still gonna make something. I'm still gonna make something inside of that, right? And so that's the way I think about love. I think about like, in the middle of this, we have to like, we gotta, we gotta dance sometimes, right? In the middle of the storm, we gotta dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I want to, um, oh my gosh, open it up to um, the audience. Does anyone have any questions for Roger? Yeah, I think in, in some ways, so in the Pentecostal church, one of the things that was really interesting to me is people that could pray really well, they were often called on to pray. Like if you had like, if you could do that, like the improvisational prayer, that was it because you set up a lot of stuff, right? You set up the choir, you could pray before the minister. So, right, so prayer became really interesting to me because I would listen to it and it was made up. It was improvised there on the spot. There was a form, there's a form, Lord, I ask, or da, 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 da. And there's this like, every now and then there's a, a way of describing the Lord, Lord, who can do this, Lord, who can make this happen, right? And I, and I, I was really interested in that as a form. Um, and I think I resisted that a little bit in my first book because I didn't really always see the place. Like when I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a poet, like I'm 20, right? At the time, I'm gonna be a poet. And I come into like poetry, and everybody's like, and nothing wrong, everybody, like no one's really coming from the background I'm coming from. And it seemed like the way my sort of very vernacular understanding of language was antithetical to what contemporary poetry was. Mm. Uh, I remember I had a, when I was, I went to Princeton undergrad and there was a poet, a very, he's one of Pulitzer, very famous white poet who told me, no, you probably, the work you're doing, it's oral. It doesn't really fit here, oh. right? So this was an undergrad, right? Um, it wouldn't really fit. I, I think you needed, you know, and so it was, so yes, very much so. Uh, and so I wanted to be very much again myself in this book, 
right? And myself as someone who's very much left the Pentecostal church, but nevertheless, really sort of there's things I've taken from it that were really kind of it'd be awesome if we, you know, brought some of that sound right mm -hmm. out, right? I think about like what Kanye does in Life of Pablo when he takes all those Chicago, I don't know if you guys know Kanye West is, but you might. Um, <laughs> but he has, he had, you might know who Kanye is. But he does this thing, which is really like, he's deep in his crates. Because if you look at like Life of Pablo, most of those tunes come from Chicago uh, black choirs from the 70s and 80s and 60s and children's choirs in particular. Right. And there's this whole Chicago gospel sound that he's really pulling on in a really beautiful way. And so I was like, oh, I can, you know, like I'm really interested in thinking about like textures, right? Like, you know, that poem where I'm talking about the bull with the pomegranate and the like that's, you know, I'm playing with Nebuchadnezzar there, right? The, the, and so I'm I don't know if y'all know who Nebuchadnezzar he was a king who winds up actually now we would say he was schizophrenic. And he eventually um he he sort of in one of his schizophrenic episodes, thinks of himself as an animal, right? Mm -hmm. And goes into the field and lives in the field for a long time. Um, and then eventually comes back. And, um, and I was always obsessed with that story as a child. Uh, and I think it was because in some ways it reminded me of my own father. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Pentecostal church. So did you, you like really came up in the church, but then later were like, I'm oh, yeah. Because this is, I'm so fascinated. I was also dragged to church as a, or not dragged when I was young, but you know. Yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got one. Sunday school, all yeah. of that stuff. But then there was this turn away. Mm -hmm. But I think, and for me, I didn't understand. Um, I have like baby Korean. So I would just hear the, it was like opera, but I wouldn't even know what they were saying, but some of the, just the rhythms mm -hmm. and everything that comes through. But I'm so grateful to know the stories they're so amazing yeah I, it's it's so funny like i was actually a minister i thought like i was called so i used to like deliver sermons when i was 16 through 18 and like they would bring me up and they would i there were times when people were like oh you're gonna take over the church um and then i went to college <laughs> and i took my first anthropology class you know i got those 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 stray secular teachings <laughs> and uh i remember coming to, I was writing this paper, I'll never forget, you know, your delay, it's freshman year, and you're like, oh, I don't feel like writing this paper, so you're up to three in the morning, and you're like, I was taking this, I was really into anthropology, and I was taking this medical anthropology course, um, where we were thinking about, like, clashes of Western medicine uh, with Eastern, particularly the Hmong people, and sort of, uh, there was a real big book in the late 90s called The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down, mm -hmm. um, and they were talking about the tension, right, and I, and I was writing a response paper and I started coming to this idea and it was really scary. I was like, oh, God is culturally created. It's not deep, but like, if you are grown up in a Pentecostal church, you'd be like, well, the way in which Hmong folks or West African or, you know, British, like we all kind of construct God out of the materials of our culture. I was like, oh, that means that no one's really right. Right, where it's all relative. And I was just like, and it destroyed me. It destroyed me. Like I wound up like getting into a deep depression. I wound up dropping out of school because I didn't know what to do. Because I was like, I've just like thought myself out of my foundation. Mm -hmm. And I turned to poems, you know, and poems were the way I was just like writing me like, you know, and so, but yeah, I, I grew up, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. My father was in, in Alabama, a minister. I found out later in life. So, you know, Amazing. yeah. I'm glad I'm glad I'm, I'm glad on the secular side though. Yes, a little yes. more pleasure in ecstasy over here. <laughs> Nothing wrong if you enjoy the other side too. There's pleasure in ecstasy there. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? I mean, we don't have to talk about church. We can talk about poems. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> <like Peter. laughs> You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> Um, I'm looking for James. James. Hi, James. Oh, yes, Hi. Amelia. Uh, not generally, you know, I'm kind of in the sort of, I would say, the Western lyric tradition of the poem is overheard, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there is times when I am, like, I think there's a way in which in this book, 
I'm definitely in conversation with the Christian God, right? In some ways, um, there are times when I'm in conversation with my partner, and like, you know, there are times that, where there is an addressee, and I'm always surprised, honestly, when that happens, because uh, I'm like, I have to try to figure out who this you is. Right? I'm like, oh, who's the you that all of a sudden there was a you that I and I had been addressing. So it it actually for me becomes really energetic. It's like a a pop in the in the poem. Um, but generally, there's not a I'm I'm addressing. There's the of course you know when I, to me the last poem was a poem. I was asked to write that poem by the Academy of American Poets because they were trying to do a series a special during uh, a special sort of month during the uprisings. And I was like, I'm gonna address black children and the black children in us. Um, but generally, nah, I'm, I'm really just like trying to get, as Outcast would say, trying to catch those feelings off instrumentals, just trying to catch feeling off a of sound um, and allowing sound to move, so. Love what you said about um, also recognizing the temperament of a poem too, because I feel like often Sometimes I'm just following a tone. Mm -hmm. It's like uncertain. I'm like, hopefully it ends up somewhere. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, temperament is really important uh, to me. That I was just talking about this with a friend of mine who's a conductor. Uh, and he conducts mm -hmm. orchestras all over, and we were talking about sort of the richness in in temperament of music and dramatic structure, uh, and the ways in which like I think we generally think of poems like happy, sad. But I'd like, there's all these other ways of doing tone, right? Somber, uh, somber with joy. Like I think about like, you know who's great? Like I think like a tone is like Sade, right? <laughs> she gives you like sad, rank, but it's also like the tinge of pleasure and ecstasy, right? It's, she's always, it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted sort of feeling in, 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 in timber and color, timbre mm -hmm. and color. And so what I'm, I'm interested in is like all the different like slightly, the way we can like, change blues in the middle of a poem right we can change our reds in the middle we can we can do these things we can have all these little shifts that's what i want to do in poetry is just like sort of express the wide range of a thing right and and, and allow all that like i don't want to put people to be like oh these poems are sad or these poems are, they're, they're actually much like us living in in all of that simultaneously and it's just trying to like catch a catch a moment and give that color Thank you. Thank y'all. We will end on that. Y'all will be. Poets will be signing books over here. We've got some books for sale. Everyone should please move your chairs up against the wall. Thanks so much for coming. I love it. So move your chairs against the wall. It's like, I know. It's, it's like church. Like, it's, it is. <laughs> No, I'm seriously. I didn't I know was, you grew up. I grew up in the church. It's the Korean immigrant. It's it's its own special flavor. Like we always like I didn't go to church until like you know when I started just not wanting to go, you know, whatever. It always starts at one because we have to wait for the white people that we rent the church for. Oh, and then like wow, okay. oh it's a whole thing. It's oh wow, like, I didn't know that. Oh my god. Because you know I live near like several Korean churches. And also, I live I live basically in the in the Asian area. Oh, you do? Yeah. I live like right on like next to the Asian market. Oh, you'll hear, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you, man. So Let me Oh George. Oh, nice to meet you. I haven't met you. I'm seeing Oh thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. So nice to meet you. Wonderful to hear you through conversation. Hey, nine nine. How are you? Good to, see, good to see you. You, met, you mentioned David, and, and I was thinking about one thing you and David have in common, you both do it brilliantly, is the way that ancient texts are alive. Yes. Not only as literary allusions, but they're alive in your life. What you said about your father. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something that activates them in your own life and, and makes them, brings them to life. Thank you, George. Man, I 